Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, the Lineate webinar series. Today's discussion is about improving pandemic response with identity management. Uh, before we get started, there are a few items to note. First off, as you just heard, uh, all attendees are on mute, so you don't have to worry about accidentally turning your microphone on. Uh, we are indeed broadcasting live, and we are recording the session so that you'll be able to uh, refer back to it uh, afterwards. You'll get that in about 24 hours. And if you have questions for the presenters, uh, please go ahead and put them in the uh, chat room um, or the chat uh, window in the uh, webinar uh, console. Uh, we do have people monitoring the chat and we'll be able to get to those questions either during the presentation uh, or at the Q&A at the end or subsequently. So uh, let's get on with the show. Uh, my name is Rico and I am your uh, host today. Uh, I joined Lineate as a um, result of the recent merger with Nextgate, where I spent 10 years uh, helping the team with their identity management uh, uh, products and uh, becoming leading the market. Um, and so, as you know, uh, Nextgate developed the EMPI and the provider registry products. Um, I am sad to announce today that uh, one of our presenters, uh, Corinne Romponte, who was the I, uh, Information Systems Business Analyst and the EMPI Manager at uh, San Francisco Department of Health, is not able to join us today. However, uh, she did say that she really wants to give the presentation and will do so uh, at a later time. I am happy to announce, however, that today I am joined by my colleague, Minakshi, uh, who started out as a customer of Nextgate and uh, the Nextgate EMPI at the Connecticut Department of Social Services, uh, where she saw the implementation of the EMPI, where it enabled multiple state departments to uh, share uh, information. And then she loved the product so much, she ended up uh, coming to, uh, to Nextgate to help guide the product direction. Um, and actually, you wanna say hello? Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, we'll talk more, but uh, I also, by way of uh, uh, social services, uh, before coming to Nextgate, I was the assistant commissioner at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in New York City. And we're going to talk about the pandemic from that perspective today. Awesome. Thanks, Manakshi. So today's discussion, uh, we're talking about real life examples of identity management challenges that were faced during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So Manakshi is going to talk about her experience at the New York Department of Health and uh, Mental Hygiene uh, from the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, they didn't have an EMPI, so there's going to be some challenges that they, uh, they had to deal with. Um, then we're going to get into the role of identity management in uh, deploying a successful public health uh, um, uh, system. And then lastly, we'll get into some recommendations uh, that were identified as a result of uh, her experience. And again, Corinne would be able to collaborate with some stories regarding San Francisco, but we'll get to that next time. So just as a, a little bit of background, why are we Lineate talking uh, about this topic? Well, for those that are unfamiliar, we are um, a technology company that is uh, focused on connecting people. And we do that through our interoperability software. Interoperability software allows the different departments, um, stakeholders, organizations within a healthcare environment uh, to share information, data exchange, and we have a special emphasis on identity management to ensure that all of that traffic that is going through the systems actually refers to uh, the same person, patient, or uh, provider. This all enables a person-centric view uh, that can be uh, presented within these different environments. And so the Lineate EMPI, briefly, um, it is an enterprise master person index and its main function is to compare records from different systems within a healthcare uh, environment, which is what we're talking about today, and to see if the data relate, uh, that is being exchanged through those different systems relate to the same person or not. You may have heard uh, or have uh, experience with duplicate records, even in your phone, you may have duplicate contacts and you know how difficult it is to, to deal with, uh, with that situation. So what the EMPI does is it builds a single best record, uh, an index 
of uh, persons uh, from across the enterprise, uh, and it maintains the uh, the most trusted demographic information on, on those people, as well as links to their records in other systems. So essentially you have a, a crosswalk across the enterprise of a person's records, their identifiers in all the different uh, environments. And this is what uh, Manakshi is going to be getting into. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before that, uh, some of the places where the EMPI has been deployed, a variety of different types of healthcare environments, hospitals, IDNs, HIEs, um, public health at all levels uh, of government, uh, from local to state to even um, you know, territories uh, uh, in Australia. And in all of these environments, again, its main focus is to compare records to see if the information uh, relate to the same person or not, so that you will, um, and it uses uh, algorithms to go ahead and determine if the records do relate to the same person or if they're, uh, they don't relate, or if there's a potential match, and then the system can help with, um, it has a user interface to help with the data governance and data management to deal with uh, those, uh, those different scenarios. So at this point, I think we would like to um, turn it over to Manakshi, where she is gonna talk about the uh, particular use case uh, with the New York City Department of Health about the vaccination process and how that was impacted by uh, the COVID-19 um, situation. Manakshi. Uh, thank you, Rico, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, just a quick uh, refresher. Uh, I know we have been in this pandemic way too long. Normally, pandemics are, and emergencies are not supposed to last this long. Uh, just the typical uh, vaccine administration process uh, that would be, uh, you know, followed by most any uh, organization or outfit that was administering uh, vaccination. First and foremost, uh, you know, we would uh, need uh, people to register or have an appointment. And that could be, you know, uh, any way uh, uh, done. But in most cases, there was a registration system that was put in place. So people could register so they would know where they would be going and at what time they would be showing up at the um, uh, said spot only because uh, uh, in the early part of the pandemic, this was happening in December of 2020, uh, when the vaccine uh, was uh, released, we had eligibility criteria, we had limited vaccine, and hence not everybody was eligible. And you know there was criteria that was uh, set um, forth by CDC. So all, uh, almost all uh, states had a registration system, which gave appointments. And uh, these appointments uh, had the information of date time, and where and any documents that were being asked for uh, by the state at the time of uh, you presenting yourself uh, when you were getting the vaccine. Uh, and then uh, on the day of the appointment, uh, some systems might uh, send out a reminder a day earlier, reminding you that you had a vaccine appointment the following day, and again, letting you know where to, you needed to come. Mostly because, you know, uh, during the early days, there were lots of logistical issues. Sometimes the vaccine delivery was delayed. Sometimes there was limited vaccine uh, and, you know, uh, some hubs were closed. And so that was a, a good reminder. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you showed up on the day of your appointment at the hub and uh, there were people uh, checking you in uh, and there would be various ways. Uh, in New York, we had flow monitors and the whole uh, incident command center at the hub that had different uh, types of functions that were being done. And then, you know, once you were checked uh, by the uh, registration staff that yes, you were at the right place at the right time for the right vaccine, uh, then you would proceed uh, to the vaccine uh, uh, nurse or, you know, doctors that were administering the vaccine, and then you would get your vaccine administered. Um, the doctors would fill out a card for you. We were all very, right? Uh, we're, in this day and age, we were uh, writing out cards, uh, which were, you know, a bit thicker than paper, uh, which is great. At least it wasn't as thin as the paper. Uh, and then uh, the doctors or the person that were administering the vaccine would fill that out for you. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in, uh, in New York's case, that was written out. And we'll talk about, you know, how we could have done that differently uh, and not have people scribble, because as we know, some writings are better than others. Uh, and so some people print better than others. Uh, so that's when the vaccine would be administered and then you would be, that would be your proof of vaccine, right? That would have your lot number and other um, uh, incidental information uh, that would be captured about the vaccine lot because, you know, sometimes uh, vaccine um, 
uh, recalls have happened in uh, like in Connecticut and New Haven, there was a batch administered and that had, you know, uh, been compromised. And so that's, there is other information besides your identifiers, identifying the vaccine lot that is on the vaccine card. And that is your proof. And then, you know, that data, once captured in the system, is reported uh, up to the, uh, the if you were, uh, you know, capturing at the local level, then it uh, is sent to the system all the way up the state and the state reports it to the CDC. And hence, you saw all those dashboards uh, at the state levels and CDC level reporting what was the progress being made on the uh, administration. So that's just about what the typical administration process is. Obviously, that there may be some experiences where processes might have been different, but this is, I just wanted to kind of lay it out. Like, this is what we're talking about and why we would want uh, to be able to identify people. Um, so that, that that's a, a typical vaccine administration process. Uh, yeah, that's that's great, Manakshi. And, uh, you know, I, I have a hard time uh, keeping track of my vaccine card and uh, 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 those of my uh, my kids. But now, uh, as a result of the pandemic, uh, things have uh, changed and I have that on my phone now. Um, what, what can you tell us about how this process changed as a result of um, having uh, COVID come upon us? So, uh, you know, the vaccine administration, so to say, I'm going to talk about it in the context of COVID-19 only and, you know, uh, and the emergency preparedness response that was triggered nationally. And as uh, everybody probably is aware that in each state, there is a emergency response agency. Now, it could be a separate agency. It could be within some other agency, uh, but uh, that's what it happens is once an emergency is declared, it triggers a standing up of an incident command center. This is all, you know, uh, things that are uh, kind of directed or have been laid out and planned for through the FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management um, or Services Organization. And so each state has that. So every state would have triggered their incident command system uh, in which, you know, there is a whole structure a parallel structure that is stood up for replacing what is the day-to-day -day business of the agency shifts to the emergency response and preparedness. And so I'm going to talk about that in the uh, my role at the uh, New York Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene. And I was there from June 2020 to June 2021. Uh, and that's what I'm going to use and the work that I did there. So I was uh, the assistant commissioner, as I mentioned. And under my bureau, we did, uh, and I'm only speaking about the COVID activities, not the other things that I was doing. And so we had a um, universal prevention, primary prevention response. Uh, to COVID-19 before the vaccine uh, was delivered. And that was to talk to people, inform people about all the changes that were happening and be able to reach the population. So that, you know, when we talk about primary um, uh, prevention, that's what the universal uh, messaging. And that was under my bureau. And I had uh, staff of about 85 people that was involved in that. Uh, then we were also involved um, in the delivery of Project Hope, which was the crisis counseling program uh, that was funded by FEMA. And the state got it, and we had a grant from the state to uh, meet the needs of uh, the 8.1 million people that live in New York City, uh, the five boroughs. And then in the uh, incident command system, I was uh, uh, I had two roles. Uh, one was the hyperlocal response lead uh, with the equity branch within uh, the command center, which means that we are looking at zip code level data because obviously the density of uh, population is a bit different in uh, you know when you're dealing with 8.1 million people. So we were wanting to make sure that all our responses, whether it was outreach, education, tests, trace, uh, all those programs were being equitably uh, distributed and uh, accessed by people in all of the boroughs. So if we found uh, data indicating that some uh, zip codes were, you know, challenged, then that would be something that we would need to deal with. And I also was the um, mental hygiene branch director. At New York State, they still call it mental hygiene, and it covers substance use, mental health, developmental disability, and justice-involved population. So that's the context in which I'm going to be speaking about the COVID portion of it and how the EMPI did or did not help us. And as Rico already gave it away, New York City did not have an enterprise master person index, meaning that we did not have a uh, system which enumerated uh, in one place uh, 
all the people um, that we were uh, working with. Uh, as is, uh, you know, a public health agency work, uh, we deliver vaccine, uh, we license people, uh, we do, uh, you know, um, STD and HIV work. We do in women, infant, and children. All those are siloed uh, systems in which, uh, per, you know, information about people is kept in a program-specific area, but it is not across the enterprise. And hence, you know, when Rico points out the Enterprise Master Person Index, what it's talking about is having a unique identity for a person uh, across the enterprise, even if they are in multiple systems. So I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the identity challenges that, uh, you know, got in the way of us responding uh, effectively and efficiently um, uh, in a way that we could have, you know, done our job a bit better. Uh, vaccine yeah, administration. I mean, that's, that's great. Yeah. That's great, Manalchi, because I know that, you know, you, you were coming to this organization from your experience at Connecticut where you did see uh, the benefits of identity management. And so there was a real contrast that you're able to uh, uh, to talk about. And so, so these are some of the challenges of not having uh, uh, an identity management strategy in place, correct? Yeah, that is absolutely right. Not having a good, clean uh, listing of people that you work with, you know, already know of, um, you know, and can work from is a benefit, you know, that gives you a leg up when you have 8.1 million people uh, potentially to vaccinate, uh, then it does give you a better idea about where they are and how you might want to uh, register them for vaccine administration. So, Rika, did you want me to go ahead and uh, go through the list, or uh, did yeah, you have? No, yeah. No, please. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I have on on uh, on the slide here a couple of the um, uh, challenges that you've identified. Yeah. So uh, the first thing is, you know, uh, registering people. Um, as I was saying, uh, that you know, if you have an enterprise master person index and you have a list of the people that you interact with, uh, that is a preemptive, you know, work that could be done where you already know the people that you want to vaccinate. And so when the people are registering, instead of having to fill out, at least in New York City, uh, they had to type out their name uh, at least five times, uh, their date of birth and gender. Those were the things that we were asking people uh, to type out and uh, in addition uh, to which borough they were in and going to get vaccinated in. Um, and so, Asking people to fill out information and these types of uh, data attributes again and again uh, is not something that I'm uh, a big fan of because I think if you have entered the data once, uh, the system should be able to use it. And in this case, you know, uh, we didn't have that. So people were entering all of that data and that was generating the list. The other challenge was that we had multiple registration systems and these systems were not talking to each other. So I, Minakshi Tiku, could have gone into all three systems, uh, taken three of appointments for any given day uh, and then showed up only for one right because I wouldn't want to get vaccinated three times in one day uh, and you know but I would have wasted the, the capacity of the system and that uh, two of the appointments that I had taken would have been wasted so that was one of the things uh, that we uh, had challenges with and when people showed up Sometimes when, you know, people had a QR code um, that we had, uh, you know, sent to them as a result of their registration, and we wanted them to come in with that, and they had to also do, remember, the COVID screening, uh, five questions. So those five questions, the day that you were going to come up, you had to fill that out. And then you had to bring that proof with you and, you know, uh, that you had done the COVID screen and that you did not have any symptoms of COVID and that you were, you know, clear to be uh, vaccinated. So sometimes we didn't find people or people forgot uh, to bring that piece with them. And then, you know, we couldn't locate them. And then, you know, there would be back and forth all, always in the initial days, only because, you know, we were, had to be very strict on eligibility and wanted to make sure that we were vaccinating uh, the people that were truly eligible and not people that, you know, were uh, just showing up because, you know, vaccine was limited. Uh, in the initial days, our registration system did go down in the first week when we were administering. And so then there was, a, uh, we were using paper forms. Uh, and anybody that has done paper forms knows uh, what happened to them and uh, not that we intentionally want to miss data uh, but people do not capture complete data and then we miss um, uh, capturing information and then those uh, forms had to you know go to a central location 
So you can imagine all the hubs in New York City uh, and all the paper that we generated at these hubs had to get to a central place where data entry could happen. And so that was a cause of, you know, uh, missing data in at least in our system. And then, as I said, the um, uh, at least in New York City, we did not have printed information. Like Purdue, as I learned from my sons, um, you know, they actually, when they administered the vaccine, they had printers, like small strips of paper that had the lot information, uh, the vaccine information, and you could just, you know, put it on the card, which was very clean. You could all read it. Uh, but in New York City, our uh, nurses and our doctors were scribbling. So you can imagine that takes longer time uh, to, you know, fill out all those lot numbers and, you know, date uh, and uh, the hub uh, where you were vaccinated. So all this, you know, adds to uh, the complexity and challenges associated with uh, uh, the response. And then we were not supporting uh, walk-in uh, appointments. And that goes back to uh, you know the challenge uh, that any system would have where we are registering people electronically right not everybody is uh, digitally equipped and not everybody has access and in new york city the diversity is high so if you were only uh, not english speaking then you wouldn't know what the form was asking you to do and we also had a spanish version but we did not have uh, many other versions and in those cases uh, what would have to happen was you had to call the 311 line to get an appointment and then get entered into the system. But again, it still had you know the problems because you have to have some identifier that you're bringing with you to the hub so that you can prove to me that yes, it is your appointment you're coming to. So if you're challenged and uh, you know you don't have a phone or you don't have a smartphone, there are challenges. And so you know, uh, not being able to support walk-ins with other kind of identifiers was a problem. And I'll talk about you know how we might have addressed that. Distribution of the leftover vaccine, um, you know, to eligible citizens. This one was a hit or miss, you know, depending on the hub and how many vaccine doses were left uh, and what the, you know, uh, first come first serve. And at that time, some hubs, uh, you know, respected the eligibility criteria and some, you know, people just called their friends. And then, you know, we had the equity discussion because that was not equitable, uh, you know. Uh, so it, it's just a lot of learning and a lot of things uh, that as you, um, look and reflect on your experience you can do better you know and then again you know this is not to say uh, uh anything else other than let's let's learn from our experience and do it better and see what can help us do our job better and you know the people obviously were tremendous uh, at the new york city uh, department of health you know the workforce was absolutely dedicated and they solved so many problems for so many people uh, then you know we were not capturing data on race location ethnicity gender and language and that is very important as we have learned since uh, that you know you want to capture this information to better understand the disparity and the inequity in the distribution in the uptake of the vaccine whether it is by choice of people uh you know and their um uh, uh, preponderance to not uh, uptake the uh, vaccine and you know you can't do that analysis if you don't have that data so you know making sure that you have those pieces of information is very important and then you know the amount of time that we waste you know when we don't have missing data and we are trying to complete something you know once the person is gone they're gone i don't know how you get missing data once the person has left and you know you don't have all the information and you don't have an enterprise master person index to query against to complete some missing pieces of information. So that wasted a lot of time and caused a lot of, you know, uh, consternation. And then that added to the reporting lag, right? Because everybody wanted to know at the end of the day, how many vaccines were administered, uh, what, uh, you know, was uh, the distribution of the vaccine by borough and, you know, and how was everybody, you know, uh, that was eligible what percent progress we had made against the marker. So those were kind of, you know, um, the challenges that we faced uh, in uh, New York City uh, as we were trying to respond and administer the vaccine. Yeah, you know, those um, challenges, uh, you know, it seems like everything should be connected. We expect things to be connected and it's and and uh, and and they're not. And that, this was added to the stress that already existed when you know things went uh, crazy. So what are some of the strategies that you came up with uh, as a result of this experience? So um, definitely, you know, uh, I have always truly believed even before, uh, you know, having a use an EMPI that once a data has been entered that, you know, that data should be used many times. One of the things that, you know, um, we could have done is we could have taken multiple sources of um, um, 
IDs that people already have. People have driver licenses, people have passports, people have uh, birth certificates, people have all kinds of information that proves that, uh, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable amount of doubt that it is who they say they are. Uh, and, you know, those data are already entered into systems. So we could have as we were preparing to, uh, you know, uh, get ready for vaccine administration, right? Because January, uh, we started seeing COVID. December is when we were very lucky uh, to have the vaccine already ready and ready for administration. That was good, enough time for us to have done some preemptive work to kind of look at our rosters, to kind of think about a strategy as to, you know, how would we know to deal with the 8.1 million people and in New York, it was, you know, the 8.1 people, resident people, and then in addition, anybody that worked. So that was our criteria. If you lived in New York City or you worked in New York City, you were eligible to receive vaccine within uh, the New York City uh, system. And so, you know, that was something that we could have done is looked at already our pre-existing systems and seen, you know, who, how many people do we already have in our system based on the information that we capture about them. And we could have coordinated the, that time and made an effort to reach out to the people, to you know, preemptively send them uh, messages to say, you know, once the vaccine is available, here are where the things are going to be. Where would you be likely uh, wanting to get the vaccine? So right, we could have get, gotten some preemptive work done. And is this still? And we would have learned how many people's emails weren't working or phones were not working. And we would have gone out and you know, tried to gather that information for them. And that time could have been used to work with the people to make their information that we had in disparate systems better in our EMPI, if you had them. If not, then you know you would have at least tried to enumerate and have a list or, or get something like that. And then linking multiple systems because you know everybody um, has some interaction with government. Whether you like it or not, you know, you interact with the government in many ways. You know, you pay taxes, uh, you go and get your driver's license, uh, you get um, other kinds of certification, you build houses, uh, you interact with government in many ways. And so, you know, there were many systems that could have been linked together to get a count and a more accurate count of uh, people together. And that's why when I say, you know, enter data once and not use it many times, that's what I'm meaning. But let's not keep asking people the same questions over and over again, uh, you know, because in the other parallel world, they have the digital experience of Amazon and then they come and interact with the city government and the state government. And they're like, really, you guys can't even register us and you can't find us. Uh, and, you know, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about that we could have done better. Uh, and uh, then more importantly for COVID, you know, the address location would have helped us better. Uh, New York City is a very densely populated city uh, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, buildings with uh, congregate uh, housing, right? Lots of apartments uh, in uh, one building. And then, you know, with COVID and the transmission and as the information was evolving about, you know, what the transmissibility was, what the variant was, how did we want to isolate people and where did we want people to isolate, we could have had much more targeted messaging for people instead of, you know, uh, Concerning everybody, if a particular zip code was experiencing high positivity, we could have messaged the people using the channels that they wanted uh, and given them that information about, you know, the positivity rate in their neighborhood and their catchment area and what, what they could do and how they could, you know, um, reduce the potential exposure of others, you know, if they were living in zip codes that were experiencing high positivity. This would also have been a good time for us to, uh, you know, when the vaccine became available to know where our elderly were and where people with uh, uh, disability were so that, you know, they were homebound, they couldn't come to us or they were just, you know, because sometimes I remember one time at uh, one of my hubs, it was taking us two hours, like, so the wait time was two hours. Uh, so, you know, I can imagine, you know, um, a person uh, that is not maybe in that good a health cannot probably stand in line. And also, you know, we didn't, we weren't serving coffee and water and food, right? Because this is COVID time. But I do remember violating that and saying, okay, water, if somebody asks for water, I'm going in and getting water for them. Because, you know, you really can't, you know, you just can't uh, 
not. And I thought, really, we should be offering coffee to everybody. We either wait for two hours in life is just completely unthinkable to me because I'm a very impatient person. I can't even wait for 10 minutes in the doctor's office to expect me to wait two hours to get a vaccine. Uh, but people did. People did not complain. People were wonderful. That's what the taught me a lot about humanity, actually. That's why I love this work was, you know, doing uh, that work taught me a lot. And again, you know, talking to people, uh, but that would have been better, right? We could have told the people that, okay, you are 70 and older. If you want to be uh, getting your uh, vaccine at home, you know, we'll figure it out. You just tell us, you know, yes, you want it at home and we'll figure that out. So that would have been a better use of technology and information and also being person-centered, right? That is what yeah. person-centeredness would have meant. And, you know, we weren't do, able to do that because, you know, it was just a logistical a nightmare. And then media, you know, everybody probably was inundated with COVID media messaging. And uh, I'm a researcher and evaluator by training, and I firmly believe that I don't think uh, we use that budget very well. Uh, it wasn't targeted. It was just the same message for everybody. And we all know that that's not how it works. And there was a lot of misinformation and disinformation. And, you know, just to be person centered, you need to think about what it is you are communicating and why you are communicating. What is uh, it that you should be communicating, given what you know about the person and how they receive information? So all that, you know, would be the strategies for improving that would, again, all be based on an identity management system, because I'm talking about person centered delivery of message person-centered delivery of vaccine, person-centered delivery of, uh, you know, any interaction that was associated with the pandemic, whether it was test, trace, anything, it had to be person-centered, right? Because it was so very specific and, and people needed to be taken care of. And, you know, whether it was their mental health, whether it was their social health, we just needed to be a bit more person-focused. And the EMPI lets you do that. Uh, which, uh, you know, if you don't know where the people are and who they are and what their preferences are, it's difficult to be person centered if you don't have that information. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into some of the uh, takeaways and recommendations uh, that you have. I mean, that's that's just fascinating. Uh, the the environment that uh, that we had to work in uh, there, um, you bring up some very, very good points. So for folks who are in similar situations and are evaluating their own uh, pandemic response, you know, anticipate this is going to happen again. Um, how would you talk about identity management in terms of some recommendations and takeaways? So, you know, uh, as I said, we did not in New York City at that time have an EMPI, but since then, um, um, you know, they uh, did put, a, put out RFPs uh, last year right now uh, for both the provider registry and a uh, enterprise master person index. So, you know, they did realize that they did not have those two assets that would have helped them uh, and made their lives a little, a little bit better. So, you know, having that, is a, it's a, a using an accurate EMPI. Uh, is a good foundation for preparing a good registration system, right? So what, what, how would that be uh, implemented? Like, instead of, you know, uh, typing all this information about yourself, uh, the system would already have you in, right? So the minute you had, like, they could say, you know, you if you have an identifier, because some people have identified, you know, you could put that, or you could put uh, upload your uh, uh, driver's license number and it would find you right so there there are many unique things uh, about us that systems know th that would have meant that i wouldn't have to type all that there was no errors oh, and that would be the opportunity to re-engage with me right to say is there any piece of information here that we have about you that is incorrect uh, and also oh by the way given that the pandemic is you know uh going on for much longer than we thought is there any better way of communicating with you that you prefer right so this could have been an a opportunity to make data about the person more accurate in the system and also to get their preferences as to how they wanted to interact during this pandemic how did they want to receive the message i mean was there anything else they preferred so that would have been you know that would have been a good thing uh, that could be done uh, if we prepare a bit better. And then I talked about, you know, the targeted messaging. And again, you know, this would be based on geolocation and geofencing of the data, right? You can uh, put a geofence around uh, the zip code and say, okay, anybody that's within this uh, zip code where the cell towers are and the cells are pinging, uh, you know, send this message to them because this is a new finding that we have that, you know, the rate of positivity of COVID in this area is high. 
and you know um uh, you, you might want to practice uh and prepare for you know what whatever precautionary measures you're taking in addition to sending the five you know uh wear a mask uh, wash your hands and all the other messages that we had for them and you saw the new york uh, city article right uh during uh which was done all of it based on cell uh phone springing that how many people left manhattan during uh, the early part of the pandemic and that people were not in new york city you know and so that there's a use for these types of information but again being person centered you would have interacted with the people gotten their preferences and then you would have done these things and then you know having data captured in real time really has an advantage right because it gives you information to make uh, decisions about your implementation and your vaccine administration in real time it tells you where you know you need to be what you need to do and where you're missing the mark and you know you can do better because you know where the people are that are not uh, taking up on the vaccine and things like that. So again, you get better information uh, when you have good tighter control and the accuracy of your information. And then uh, you know I talked about uh, the ease of identification. Uh, then it lowers your uh, error rate, which could be because of missing data or duplicates in your system, right? So if you do better job of identification and keeping that list clean. Uh, then all of those things, you know, uh, are not something that you need to worry about. So in conclusion, really, uh, for um, I believe, and this is, uh, I firmly believe that, that an accurate EMPI uh, could have better support testing, uh, tracking people that have COVID and tracing. All of these infrastructures could have benefited a lot more and our uh, administration and uh, systems would have worked much more efficiently and much more effectively in an active, equitable, safe and person-centered way had we had an EMPI that helped us do our job a bit better. Uh, all very good stuff, uh, Manakshi. Thanks thanks for that. Um, questions come that came in. How does an EMPI uh, compare the records for the population of New York City with such a wide variety of demographics? Uh, can, can you talk a bit about how the EMPI can can manage a population of you know over eight million? So um, when we talk about uh, an EMPI, uh, you know, so this uh, when we are talking about comparison, particularly, what that means is that you are ingesting data from multiple systems, right? At that time, based on the algorithm that Rico was uh, talking about, uh, you know, the algorithm uh, looks at are how many people are unique and how many people because we are using multiple systems uh, may have two entries or more entries and what your EMPI is trying to do is you, it's comparing uh, two people that could be the same person and making a determination whether or not it is truly the same person or these are two distinct persons and for example you know if they if it's a Minakshi Tiku that name is not very common uh, you know, if, if you're in India, that's a common name, but in uh, America, it's not that common. It will give it a different weight. But if we had, say, a John Smith, there are lots and lots of John Smiths, right? So then we need additional information, which will be coming from multiple systems. And we can also rate one system as having better information than other. And that's how you create that enterprise view of the people. And then you will have a group uh, of people that will be that the system is saying, I cannot distinguish if this is the same person or a, uh, you know, different. And then we have a uh, methodology that we employ, uh, you know, one, you can um, reach out to the person to help them disambiguate that data or you can use third party data sets to disambiguate that data too but over time uh, you know this becomes a clean list of people and you have and you can calculate the accuracy of your identity management system i hope that answers rico did that answer the question i believe it did uh, in terms of the uh, the algorithms have the capability of uh, comparing all kinds of data and you know they use probabilistic algorithms and and sound um, you know, metaphone sounding uh, algorithms and so forth, so that it has uh, a quite a, a bandwidth to be able to compare records. It's not just deterministic. Um, yeah. And we also have the capability to do referential uh, matching. I know that that is something that has been talked about uh, in the industry. 
where we can also, in addition to looking at the, own, the data that you provide or that you have on your own, we can go out to an external database and see if uh, that person uh, has um, credit history, for example, that may help in the adjudication of these records. So I think so. So Manakshi, um, that's wonderful. We've come up upon our uh, our time. So I'd like to uh, begin uh, the, the close of the, uh, the webinar. So uh, thanks everyone for attending today. We hope you found the information, uh, well, informative and valuable. And uh, please check in uh, to the Lineate uh, website to um, see our calendar of upcoming uh, monthly uh, webinars. And again, this is gonna, this has been recorded and you'll receive a, a notification that the a recording is available for you to refer to again or to uh, share. So again, thank you for everyone uh, for joining. Manakshi, it's always wonderful to have you and, uh, and listen to your um, experience. So thanks everyone, have a great day. Cheerio. Thank you.